my pleasure to, to have Aaron from the center, of, the director of the Center of Election Science, is that right? Or the executive director. Executive yes. director. Um, yeah, the, their organization does a, a lot of great work. I've um, really enjoyed uh, kind of following them and um, getting involved how I can. Um, you know, trying to trying to make our elections better and more civil, and uh, just make smarter decisions about, uh, you know, how how we govern ourselves. So, uh, with that, uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Great. Thanks, Ted. So uh, today, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what exactly a voting method is and why that matters, and to give an overview of our organization at the same time. So our organization, uh, to put it simply, we study and advance better voting methods. Uh, when uh, looking back at the origin of our organization, we were rather agnostic about the voting method in terms of which one to push. And also even now, the voting method that makes sense is largely dependent on the context that we're working to implement the method. So largely right now, we also look at equitable voting, uh, kind of because it fits this sort of warm zone in terms of not being too uh, complex, while at the same time doing a good job in terms of maximizing utility for the electorate. So how do we go about doing what we do? Uh, we have kind of three branches within our organization. Uh, we conduct research. Uh, often this is polling research. We did polling in the 2016 election. We we'll also do that again in the 2020 election. Uh, we uh, take a different approaches for uh, educating the public. Uh, this can be through our website, uh, through public talks, um, uh, through other types of advertising, and then we also coordinate with other organizations to advance initiatives, uh, particularly ballot initiatives. So what is a voting method? A voting method is the information uh, that you put on the ballot and what is done with that information to compute a result. And then you have a winner, could be one winner, could be multiple winners, depending on the particular voting method. Why do voting methods matter? Uh, voting methods matter because they determine who gets elected. Uh, they can determine who decides to run in the first place. They can determine uh, what kind of uh, support a particular candidate is gauged at. And that in turn can determine whether or not uh, specific candidates get airtime, whether their views are taken seriously. It can even determine within the people who win whether they take on certain causes that they may not have otherwise taken. And of course, when we're looking at uh, voting methods, it determines who sits in the seats that decides uh, very important policy issues, whether we're talking about environmental uh, issues, healthcare, and of course, spending vast amounts of money. So it's important that we use a very good voting method to decide who sits in those seats to make those decisions. So when we're looking at a, a voting method, we have to look at all these different types of uh, criteria, kind of like a voting method has a job to do. So when we're looking at a voting method, a voting method has to do a good job at electing a good winner. Uh, if you can, you want to minimize complexity to the degree that that's possible. And even, so a voting method in itself, sometimes a voting, multiple voting methods can choose the same winner, but it's important that the, even when a particular candidate isn't selected as a winner, that their support is gauged accurately. And that's important so that when new candidates come to the, and bring ideas to the table, that they're not marginalized unfairly, that even if they don't win, that their support is accurate. So when they do bring these ideas, you can see the public's uh, support of those ideas as well. We want a voting method to encourage competition. So if a voting method does something like uh, tells people that they're going to spoil an election if they run, that's not a very good thing because that can discourage uh, new people from running. We want a voting method to be simple, uh, as simple as possible. Uh, so when we're looking at things like 
precinct some ability, uh, we would like a voting method to be able to uh, tabulate its results at the precinct level and then take those totals and add them up at a, a group aggregate level rather than, say, forcing all the ballot tabulation to be done in a single location. Um, to the degree that you don't have to add fancy software, that's helpful. And when we're talking about different types of methods, such as proportional, uh, proportional methods, uh, we want to make sure that representation is there for, for everybody. So the, the bad news is that the current method that we use for uh, voting is terrible. Uh, this is our choose one voting method uh, called plurality or first past the post. It has a whole laundry list of things that are wrong with it. So because you can only choose one candidate, the vote can divide between similar candidates. Uh, there is a, an issue where it can cause more extreme candidates to win by squeezing out uh, centrist candidates. Uh, you can't always vote for your favorite. If a candidate is perceived as not being very viable, you may instead choose one of the front runners so you don't waste your vote. And because candidates are worried about uh, uh, being a spoiler, um, it can uh, discourage some candidates from running. And also, when good candidates do run, if they're not perceived as being viable, even when they bring good ideas to the table, they can get an inaccurately low measure of support, which can in turn have them marginalized by media and other outlets. And this is terrible for third parties and independents um, because these are exactly the types of folks who are considered spoilers and can be uh, dissuaded from running and marginalized. And to give more credence for the way that uh, our current system is running. We see that average uh, citizens uh, play uh, very little role, uh, statistically uh, nothing at all, um, in terms of being able to uh, have their preferences be predictive of actual policies. So the tool that we have is just not very effective for the average voter. Also, it's clear that the electorate as a whole has preferences in terms of uh, having certain people having a shot at getting elected. So most people uh, say that a third party is needed and uh, the plurality of voters are independent rather than identifying explicitly for Democrats or Republicans. Mm -hmm. And yet, when we look at these uh, lines that are practically flatlined on the bottom of the screen, uh, that's looking at the actual um, registration for third parties and looking at the uh, number of third parties that are getting elected. So we see this enormous discrepancy, and this is because of our choose one voting method. So the method that we largely advance is a method called approval voting. Approval voting allows you to select as many candidates as you want. The candidate with the most votes wins. So it's very simple. And approval voting does a lot of nice things very well. So for instance, it tends to elect consensus winners. You can always vote for your honest favorite. And this one, I, I think, is something where we maybe kind of take this for granted as a gimme, but it is not a gimme at all. It's actually very difficult for a voting method to always allow you to uh, give your full expression of support for your favorite candidate. Mm. It, it actually turns out that's a very hard thing for a voting method to do, but approval voting does that uh, very well. Uh, in fact, it does it perfectly. And you don't have to worry about uh, it. Uh, approval voting does an excellent job at mitigating uh, vote splitting. Uh, so if there are multiple candidates who are similar, you can support multiple of those candidates rather than picking only one so that it avoids that dividing of votes. And voters are able to express a more uh, fuller opinion uh, within their ballot, rather than just choosing one candidate. And when you look at candidates who don't win, uh, it's important that they get a more accurate reflection of support as well. And approval voting does a great job at making sure that that uh, support is reflected. And, it, and the reason for that is for a couple of reasons. One is because you can always support your honest favorite no matter what. So you're not afraid of expressing that information and offering that information 
in the first place. And the other part is, and this is something that can be easily uh, overlooked, with approval voting, you're just tabulating uh, all the votes for all these candidates. And so you're given all this information and the algorithm, which is just adding up all these votes, is using all that information simultaneously. So all the information that you're providing is being used at the same time, and you get to see that all at once, which is not necessarily the case for other voting methods. So when we're uh, reaching out and trying to spread better voting methods, such as approval voting, uh, what we do is we look at particular target cities. Oftentimes, uh, advocates from within individual cities reach out to us. Uh, we work with them, if they're not already, uh, to become a 501c4, which is a certain type of nonprofit that can do more advocacy works, uh, advocacy work. And we tend to prefer that they have experience already, um, just because it makes the partnership a lot, uh, a lot easier to work with. And then we run the Center of Production Science runs education campaigns and does outreach alongside the other organization, which focuses on the direct advocacy and then also uh, making sure that they have strong relationships within, uh, with key stakeholders within that community. And in terms of the outreach, we do this in all kinds of ways through public forums, uh, community events, educational literature, uh, radio, and digital advertising. Uh, in fact, we did this uh, within the city of Fargo, North Dakota, which is where you're seeing some of these pictures from. Uh, Fargo is a city of 120,000 people. Uh, they had some issues with their elections where there were like uh, five or six people running and the candidate won with something like 22% of the vote. It was just ridiculous. And even worse, that was not an anomaly within their elections. They had had this sort of issue come up before. Mm. And so they created a task force. The commission uh, for their city ignored the task force that they created uh, when their task force recommended approval voting. And in fact, they did that for over a year, which was even more embarrassing. And so one of the uh, uh, individuals on that task force had reached out to us and we worked with them. Uh, they created uh, an organization local, uh, local to Fargo, uh, which was called Reform Fargo. And we worked with them in order to uh, help them run this, uh, run this campaign. And uh, one of our, uh, this is a quote from one of our campaign coordinators who was on the ground uh, in Fargo, uh, who uh, admitted to being motivated uh, to the fact that she would be able to make history in having approval voting, uh, uh, to have the city of Fargo be the first city in the United States to ever use approval voting. And uh, we actually were successful in that campaign. And Fargo, North Dakota, in uh, 2018, last year, last, this uh, just past November, became the first city ever to implement approval voting. And it'll be used in the first time in the general election in 2020. Hmm. Uh, so other ways to learn about what we do, uh, we have our website, electionscience.org. Um, you can find information uh, from blog posts. We do some technical analysis within those posts. Uh, so oftentimes looking at government elections, but collective decisions are uh, take place in all kinds of different contexts. So often we uh, get creative in, in terms of looking at different ways that collective decisions take place, often in organizations with awards. And we're also a good uh, resource for um, uh, other uh, either in just like uh, um, electoral systems glossary. We've got a, a ton of terms within uh, voting methods. And so we try to make that a bit uh, easier and digestible, digest, digestible for folks. And in terms of how you can help, uh, we have a toolkit that folks can download off of our site, uh, different ways to get involved, such as volunteering. And a lot of this information is something that is not common knowledge for, for people as well. So being able to follow us on social media, we're on just about all of them. Um, and being able to share our work is very helpful. And of course, the reason that we're able to do the things that we do uh, is because of generous supporters who are able to give and support our cause. 
Um, looked like Sunnyvale had a few questions if you want to ask live, otherwise I can read it off the Dory. We good? Can you hear us? Yes. Hi, I'll pull up my list of questions. Hi, Aaron. It's Greg. Um, I'll start with the fun one. Uh, so I've been in approval vote. Yeah, hey, Greg. Yeah. Oh, hey, Greg. Hey. So I've been an approval voting fan since before uh, CES existed, uh, and I remember when it was founded. And I have yet to have any swag. I have no T-shirt for which I can advertise my affiliation with CES or approval voting. Um, and I saw those wonderful Fargo pictures that, that there, at least for that campaign, there there was. <laughs> so is there a section, uh, I'd be quite happy to buy this stuff, but is there a section uh, that CES has or is planning to have uh, just to sell some apparel so people who want to support this stuff can, can let themselves be known? Yeah, um, yes, we, we do need to, we, we bring things to different events. Uh, I have, uh, for this one, I don't have any t-shirts with me. I do have some chip clips uh, for folks that are here. Um, uh, but our operations person is working on uh, making it easier for folks to be able to buy apparel. So we we have heard you, and we are, we are uh, working to make that easier for folks to be able to uh, show their support in a very visible way. All right, I'm looking to see what else I have in the Dory. Uh, I guess I'm gonna monopolize a little bit. Um, do you have a wish list of what you wish that either Googlers who are sufficiently engaged or Google as a whole company would do uh, in order to help support uh, better election methods and decision-making, uh, especially if that looks like a product feature? If there's, you know, if there's some gap <laughs> in our products where you're like, if only there was a voting system right here and it was good. I think that being able to have like a really clear app for um, group decisions is pretty helpful. Uh, there are some out on the market already, like um, I'm trying to think on the, the one that tends to let you uh, Pick a, a date and throw on a blank on the, the name uh, of it. Doodle or Doodle, yeah. Doodle polls are are, uh, are really good. Um, but uh, providing folks with different ways to make those collective decisions, uh, although th there is some of that in there. Um, um, really, like anytime internally, whenever you're making collective decisions, uh, don't use plurality voting. I think <laughs> is uh, is is a good mantra. Um, and being able to use alternatives such as approval voting. When using small groups, uh, score voting, uh, when you score candidates on a scale is a good idea. Um, and uh, one of the technical reasons for that is when you have a uh, small uh, sample size, you have more random error, uh, score voting has more uh, sensitivity along the scale and sensitivity with your measurement instrument will reduce random error so you get a more accurate result when you have a small sample size. Um, and uh, of course, uh, um, uh, with uh, Google having uh, matching with gifts, uh, that always goes a long way in terms of making sure that we can, uh, we can get work done, we can spread this to, to other cities. So how about a segue there? So I know you have a campaign at Fargo that was successful. Uh, I haven't heard about what other cities you are, um, your, our prospects right now. Um, do you have anything to tell us? Yeah, yeah. So we've we've got we've been working with uh, a group uh, recently, and we're just firming up our uh, MOU, and they're applying for a grant with us. Um, we haven't announced it publicly, uh, but the city is over three hundred thousand that we're looking to hit next, hmm. and we'll be making that announcement within the next few weeks or so. So it's a, a two T's. Um, I see there's a question from Mountain View um, from the live stream. Um, so you mentioned approval voting is one of the few voting methods where it's safe to vote for your fa favorite. Mm -hmm. um, 
how should a voter choose which of their second favorites to also approve? Like what's the kind of algorithm to pick a good threshold for approve or not? Yeah. Um, so tactically, there are, there are a number of heuristics that you can use. You could say um, among the front runners, um, who do you like uh, as, uh, as your favorite candidate uh, among the front runners? Support that candidate and everyone else that you like more than that candidate, uh, which would include other people in like maybe the, the middle of the, the race who are uh, moderately competitive and then folks who are not competitive at all. That might be like a kind of a quick heuristic. Hmm. Um, and then if you're <clears throat> uh, another uh, issue, maybe if say, like maybe you're a little bit on the left and there's a candidate in the middle and a candidate on the right. And then um, there's, it's a kind of a tight three-way race. Um, if you um, would find that person in the middle acceptable, it may be uh, appropriate to support that candidate in the middle just to hedge your bets against um, the candidate who is on the far right. Or if you find yourself maybe center right um, and then there's a candidate on the center and the left, and you would find the candidate in the center acceptable, um, and you really don't want the candidate more on the left winning, um, then it would also make sense for you to support that candidate in the center. Do you have to educate, like in Fargo, did you have to educate the population on how to use this type of voting? Like basically what you just told us now. Yeah, so with uh, the city of Fargo, we did um, uh, a lot of media outreach, and then um, uh, getting people to come to our site to learn more about approval voting. And so the education component was a large part of that, that outreach. We had public uh, meetings, so there have been a number of different approaches to, to get out there. I have another. Um, I know like gerrymandering is like a big issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has this been studied? Like with that issue, like, is there any research there saying like this will help mitigate that or? There, so there's there's no research looking at approval voting relative to gerrymandering. Um, approval voting tends to elect a more consensus style winner. So like even if, um, so if you were to say to take a, a single member district and gerrymander it, um, you would still push even the approval voting winner over to whatever say the median is for that particular electorate. Uh, if you want to, if you don't like gerrymandering, which I don't know many people that do other than people who are elected, uh, then the, the way to go uh, uh, and circumvent that is to use multi-member districts mm -hmm. and to use a proportional voting method. Um, and you can use, there are proportional versions of approval voting that, that can be used. Um, but that's the, so oftentimes people look at it and say, well, um, maybe I'll get this computer algorithm to draw some lines using some metric that's not associated with partisanship, or uh, we'll get this independent commission together and they will draw the lines in some way that is nonpartisan. But, there, there's an issue when you take, it's kind of like a really bad sampling technique mm -hmm. uh, when you do winner take all because the surplus uh, doesn't go to anything when you get more votes than you need. And when you get less votes, when you get fewer votes than you need, then you uh, don't do anything. And so you have all this waste uh, occurring whenever you're doing these winner take all elections. And in fact, Canada has used independent commissions since 1964 and two of its past uh, recent elections, they had what are called false majorities, which is when a party can have uh, less than half of the, of the vote and they get more than half of the seats. Mm. Uh, and it went both ways. So it, in, in one election, it, was, uh, it didn't work out for conservatives and it benefited uh, liberals. And then uh, uh, another uh, election uh, right after that, it was the opposite. Mm. Um, and so you get these really kind of blatantly unfair results uh, from using this, uh, this these winner-take-all approaches. And you get around that by 
using a multi-window proportional method where if you're going to do it still district-based, you want those seats to uh, be of at least five or more. Um, and, the, and as the number of seats that you elect simultaneously increases, um, so does the proportionality. Um, so with uh, choose one voting, um, whether it's like Washington's top two that we do in a primary or um, parties doing the national presidential primaries, things like that, um, I guess, do you, what role do you see for a primary type thing combined with approval voting? Um, could you see throwing just literally everyone into one giant bag and then they all fight or some kind of weeding down process or uh, what do you think about that? There are, um, that's actually a, an issue that we directly had to contend with because when, when we're looking at different um, jurisdictions to collaborate with and implement approval voting, you've got issues like uh, it has to be, you have to ha have ballot initiative, uh, you have to, if you're looking at cities, like you have to have a home rule state so that the city doesn't have to get explicit permission from the state. And, and another issue that we come up with is that uh, the state itself will require that all of its cities uh, do something like uh, use priority voting uh, for the office. So they'll say that you can't choose more uh, candidates than there are seats to be filled. Mm. Or they'll say something like uh, they'll make a majority requirement, uh, explicitly requiring a, a runoff. In Texas, uh, they're so strict about that, that they don't even count instant runoff voting as meeting the majority requirement. Hmm. And so the way around that uh, is for, for both of those is to have uh, an open primary. Uh, it could be uh, partisan where people can throw their uh, the letter by their name, but still have it be open so voters can choose anyone that they want. Or you could have a nonpartisan where there are no letters by these candidates' names. And then uh, from there, uh, if you're required to use plurality in the general election, or if you're required to get a majority, um, the, the way that you would satisfy both those criteria would be to have just two people go on to the general election. Um, and so in the general election, you're using plurality voting, which is fine in this case, because only two people are running. The voting method really only matters when you have more than two choices. When there are only two choices, plurality voting is fine. Um, and so it addresses all the vote splitting nonsense that would otherwise occur under a priority voting for the for the primary. So you can use a approval voting for the primary. So you've got this long list of candidates. Approval voting deals really well with that. It's really easy, even with a long candidate list, to use approval voting. Uh, and then the top two would go over to the general election. We had some more questions in Sunnyvale. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the um, back on gerrymandering. So I agree with what Aaron said. I do want to point out um, that um, it's not perfect by far, but things algorithmic redistricting or uh, redistricting commissions are better than the lack of them. And there are lots and lots of algorithmic proposals out there. And one of them is by a Zoogler named Brian Olson, who's doing the Massachusetts office. Um, and those tend to do pretty well unless you very strongly care about the idea of having a community cohesed together in a district as opposed to the district having somewhat arbitrary boundaries. Yeah. So with uh, different like uh, kind of line drawing algorithms, uh, so the, the, the idea is that they, they're not really a solution um, because of just like you're using this inherently bad uh, sampling method. Um, but uh, they're certainly worse, uh, which is what we're doing right now. And so like there, there is a terrible approach, which is allowing uh, a particular uh, party or group to leverage to the uh, greatest degree poss possible to give them as much power as possible. So that would be like the worst end. Um, but even when you have, uh, uh, for instance, independent commissions like in Canada, uh, there, the, the, the party that got more than half of the seats, in that case, they were winning that with just a sliver less than 40%. And so that's still a pretty egregious result. 
Uh, and that's just inherently, you, that's due to this uh, inherent uh, vulnerability when we're using these, uh, these single member districts. Um, so it, you, you can mitigate that somewhat, but you're still in a bad situation. For those of us who do live in plurality voting areas, do you have advice for uh, how voters can avoid the pitfalls of plurality voting? Yeah. Uh, so uh, move to Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's really a bad situation. Um, you could, uh, yeah. I mean, you could do different types of protest votes, write letters to the editor, mm -hmm. uh, protest votes, like vote for somebody that you really like, even though they're not gonna win, but you're, you're doing that at the cost of not having a say in the outcome of the election. Um, yeah, it's, it's really a bad situation to be in, and it's one that almost everyone is in. Um, related question on the Dory from Joseph in New York. Um, Changing the voting system is kind of against the interests of the people currently in power. Um, so how how did something like the Fargo reform happen? Yeah, yeah. so the, the way that we did that is we didn't ask the people in power. We just ran a ballot initiative. Uh, so you, you circumvent those people that can say no to you. Hmm. That's how you take care of that. Um, it, Although that, that strategy may change over time. For instance, like for instance, another voting method is a runoff voting, which we're not as excited about. Um, with that one, the, there does seem to be more legislative track there. Um, and part of that is to have it having more of a history. So right now, the door to um, approval voting being implemented, it, there really isn't a very good door in terms of uh, legislators saying, okay, this is a good idea. You should be using this. We'll vote on it. And then every, like all of my colleagues will also vote on it. That, that's, that's something that's really an option right now. But over time, that may be something that opens up, uh, particularly as you start to get um, closer to a tipping point with more people mm -hmm. implementing approval voting. But we've got a lot of work to do before that, uh, before we're close to that point. Mm -hmm. um, another question from New York. Um, why approval voting instead of uh, something with a more expressive uh, like score voting where you pick a number of stars? Uh, so, so one thing to keep in mind when thinking about a voting method is that it has multiple components. So, um, so the expression element is one component, but there's also the calculation element. Uh, score voting, so, and there are other voting methods that allow you to provide uh, more information. <clears throat> so, ranking methods that you provide more information. Um, score voting uh, lets you provide uh, more information. The, the issue with, and I'll go to score in a moment, the issue with ranking methods is uh, the algorithm that's, that's used um, for a particular method. So, for instance, with instant runoff voting, even though you're explicitly providing more information, the algorithm itself uh, may actually ignore some of that information during its calculation and can allow a number of anomalies to occur. So the, the can't ignore the algorithm um, and just look at the expression element in isolation. Uh, with score voting, score voting is, I would say, in terms of both expression and the utility that it offers, is better than approval voting. Uh, in terms of the outcome that you get. The reason that we uh, push approval voting over score voting, um, at least right now, is because it is just so easy. Like It is really, really easy. You just change the directions to from choose one to choose all the candidates that you want. And it, the, even the dumbest of voting machines can can figure this out. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it works out very well. Uh, and so when, when looking at, uh, like one of the jobs of a voting method is to pick a good winner to offer high utility to the electorate on average. 
And so you, you do get a bit of a utility gain from going from approval voting to score voting, but there's also that complexity cost. Uh, and the perceived complexity cost can be high given that most people don't even know what a voting method is, that it's not even a concept on their radar. And so going from this choose one method to score voting is a high complexity cost for, for those folks. So the kind of the range of acceptances can be more challenging there. And then also you have logistics for, uh, for, for voting machines in, in some cases. And so the, the difference in utility that you go from a, approval voting to score voting uh, that's not, um, it's not nothing, uh, but it's not a huge amount. Uh, what is a huge amount is moving from plurality voting or this choose one method that we have now, it, and going from there to what we have now, that is a large amount. And so we're focused on getting that enormous gain uh, before thinking about squeezing out the last bit of utility that we can, because there, because we can take this even further, like we can say, okay, well, there are other variants of voting methods that give you even more utility. And then, but the question is how much complexity costs are we, are we willing to pay for that? Mm -hmm. And right now we pay really a token complexity cost in order to get an extremely high utility uh, gain from the current method that we're using now to approval voting. I had a question that follows on from that. Um, that was one of my Questions is uh, is the use at adapting existing uh, systems, whether they be uh, ballot marking devices or paper, you know, forms, etc. To this new system, it seems like a very small uh, logistical change. Is that does that is that actually borne out in practice? Oh, uh, so before I could say that explicitly, I think we'd have to uh, wait until uh, next year in, mm -hmm. in Fargo. To, but I don't expect there to be any issues when uh, talking with uh, folks on the ground there um, who also uh, communicated with the people who are actually running the elections in Fargo, and they don't expect any issues with this, uh, with this method. Um, and to kind of uh, pull that out a bit more, uh, there are voting methods that we use right now that allow people to pick multiple candidates. You look at things like um, uh, block priority voting when they're selecting a council, uh, for instance, when you can pick as many uh, candidates as there are seats to be filled. Hmm. Uh, some cities use cumulative voting, which is a semi-proportional method. Uh, there you have as many kind of pips or votes, votes as there are uh, candidates, and you can stack votes on individual candidates. Hmm. Um, and so like, those are our methods that we already see in practice. And of course, you look at um, uh, cities that use instant runoff voting, and that's a way more complex method. So, yeah, cool. it, it does appear to be more complex at, at, at first glance, um, the instant, run, instant runoff, um, and people and the cities are using that. Um, so that's attractive. Um, it would be great to see what the experience is and have that as information that people can use when they're, you know, trying to persuade their locality. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I'll be right there with you watching. One thing that comes to mind, I was thinking of like, there seems to be, it's almost with the approval voting, the voting is almost more diffuse and that you'd have kind of the left wingers will vote for the left candidates. The right wingers will vote for the right candidates, and 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 these sorts of things. But does that does that open up an opportunity for like some special interest groups, like say like a single digit percent of the population that wants to to vote in a radical candidate, so they only vote for this one candidate, um, and then their votes are very targeted, whereas everyone else's votes are somewhat diffuse. Do you see something like that happening? Um. Not unless the radical candidate has some consensus issues that they're able to rally around. Um, so this particular voting method really does tend to elect more consensus style winners. Uh, and data that we've seen, like uh, for instance, there's one um, French election. Um, uh, here, if you look at the graphic to the right, um, uh, Bayrou was more of a um, centrist moderate candidate. And here in this election, 
um, that candidate was the one that was uh, preferred over uh, both the um, candidate that was uh, more on the left and the other one that was more on the right. And like you can look at the third party uh, candidates in here too, and there you're gonna get more fringe opinions. Um, and while they got more support than they otherwise would, uh, they still weren't in the position to kind of take over um, the, the lead uh, with, with relevant to, to other candidates. Um, and this is also a really nice visual in general. Uh, uh, you can look at the German election over to the uh, left of that too. Um, here, like you see that even when the winner doesn't change, the reflection of support that you get from uh, for third party and independent candidates is really, really quite significant. Um, here's another uh, peak from the 2016 election. Uh, so this is looking at a, a poll that we had done looking at uh, approval voting and plurality voting. Uh, you used to see enormous differences in terms of um, uh, the amount of support that candidates got under approval versus priority voting, even when the winner doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Does it appear that approval voting or any other of these um, non-pick ones uh, has any impact on turnout? Um, it's a little unclear. I'm not sure um, with the IRB election so far. Um, there does seem to be a role with the voting method and uh, turnout with proportional, uh, with countries that use proportional representation. Hmm. So, and, but it's maybe a bit unclear why that is. Uh, it could just be that their vote is more effective, that they're more likely to get someone elected, that their vote is more meaningful. And to the degree that that's uh, salient to voters under an approval voting election, it's uh, quite possible that that would increase voter turnout. Um, it, the, the voter turnout is kind of, I, I, that's like a, a really kind of popular uh, uh, issue or, or, or metric to, to point to, perhaps because it's like a, a salient thing, it's very easy to measure. Um, when, when looking at voter turnout, I look at it a couple of ways. Like one, maybe it's kind of a, a, a proxy measure for uh, uh, voter engagement that they believe in the system. Um, but in terms of it being important for the outcome, I look at it a bit more from survey sampling. So when we're interested in what a, a population thinks, we don't need to ask every individual within that population, so long as the sample that we take is representative of the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, I'm not quite as worried about uh, voter turnout. Uh, although what does worry me is when the sample that we're taking or the people who do go out and vote aren't representative of the population as a mm -hmm. whole. When you see certain segments either not going out to vote or being blockaded from being able to vote, those are those are real issues. So, for instance, polling likely voters versus adults. That would be like your right. discrepancy in sampling. Correct. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, you, you want those groups to be the same, mm -hmm. um, but that's not always the case. Would you accept some uh, speculative commentary on that? Because I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, this is going to be my perspective, you know, all the grains of salt. But you, you look at the system right now in the US, and we have the two dominant parties, Democrats and Republicans. They're basically the only ones that win uh, elections, at least in, in large scale. Maybe you get the occasional local candidate or something. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's the two party system, we always call it that. We, we all know that it's a two party system. Um, that comes from the plurality voting method that helps to reinforce this. Like, you look at the chart up there, and you see third parties at one in two percent when really they're e even for this one specific poll we're, we're talking about 20 points or something and I, I think this gives you an iterated effect that squashes those numbers down even lower than they would otherwise be because that that two percent is the two percent of people who like voted anyway despite the fact that everyone knows they're not credible if you started showing people those you know 12 and 20 percent um i think those would amplify over time to something a lot less suppressed um and i i don't I, you know, I think one of the reasons that we have really low turnout in the U.S. is because our government is really ineffective and it really doesn't implement things that have wide public support. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything that we can do to improve the quality of the voting method, even a little bit, um, is going to make it much more likely that we'll have a more effective government that actually does what people want. And um, I, th I think we're in a suppressed state where it's just bad enough that 
people rationally, to some extent, see that they there's no reason for them to engage because they're going to get one of two choices instead of what they actually want. Um, and I, I could see voter turnout uh, dramatically improving if we do even just a little bit to break a, a two-party domination, uh, which is one of the reasons that I got excited about the cardinal methods like uh, score and approval voting, um, because instant runoff voting doesn't seem to uh, break two-party systems. You can look at that in the uh, Australian government. They've been using instant runoff for uh, over 100 years, and um, they've had domination by two major parties in almost all seats uh, most of the time, except for a couple of years when they were swapping parties uh, earlier in the century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Another question from the Dory. Um, basically, are there easier ways to experiment with uh, voting methods? Like, are there jurisdictions where you don't need a whole ballot initiative to, to change it? Or um. Like there are a few ways to, to do it for government elections. One is ballot initiative, which means you got to go out there and get a bunch of signatures. You can do referendum, which you somehow convince the, the council or the legislature to say it's a good idea, and then they put it before the, before the voters, and then the voters vote on it. Um, and then sometimes they get really lucky. They can just uh, pass a law outright to, to change the voting method. Mm. Uh, but you, you've you got to have the, the sun really shining on you that day. <laughs> um, if you like, I can address the uh, uh, issue of third parties, like actually gaining seats. Yeah. Um, so with uh, Michael's uh, commentary, the um, you can expect a, kind of a, um, a feedback loop where, where support can grow. One interesting thing about this uh, figure that's on the screen now looking at the third party support was that there was a Gallup poll earlier in the year that, uh, that said that two thirds of people didn't even know who Stein or Johnson were. Uh, so. Uh, imagine an election where they at least get that much support, like uh, 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 12%. I think uh, there, there are different ways of kind of cutting that data um, because of the, the weighting, but it may be as low as 9%, but still quite a lot more than, than the 1% initially. Uh, you, you can imagine like the media not being able to marginalize the same way and then having to cover them or getting into debates uh, and then seeing that support grow. Uh, and then the, the other issue in terms of third parties getting actually elected using alternative voting methods, uh, there is one uh, uh, approach of looking at that or framework of looking at that called Diverge's Law. And Diverge's Law looks at a couple of factors. One is the threshold of support needed to get someone elected, uh, which under a single winner voting method, it's always going to be high, which is more support than any other candidate. And even approval voting, or score any kind of cardinal method, any method at all that's a single member, single winner method, it's gonna have issues there. Uh, the other factor is being able to support your honest favorite candidate no matter what. And so that's really where within the single winner framework that approval voting can have a shot at getting uh, third parties elected. And it's not that you, what I don't expect to see even with approval voting is the, extent of third party representation that you see in countries uh, like uh, like France or, or or other countries using proportional representation. Mm. Um, it, so you, you would get more than we have now, uh, particularly for exciting would be with executive seats. But in terms of getting the type of representation for third parties that you're seeing in other countries, if you really want that, then you need to use a proportional method. This will only get you partly there uh, for electing third parties and independents. Um, but if you if you want to see a lot of that, uh, um, like four or more uh, active parties uh, within the government, then you need to, then you need a proportional method. Mm. Um, yeah, another question um, from Doug in New York. Are we going to end up with ballots that are hundreds of candidates long, or is there 
a way that makes sense to limit to a reasonable number of candidates? Yeah, so uh, right now, I, that's more of a valid access uh, issue. And right now, the, the, the US has some of the most draconian valid access laws in the entire world. Uh, but say uh, part of the part of the reason for that is that um, the so we we know that the voting method doesn't matter so much when you only have two candidates and from people who are elected the way they look at it as well we could either use a sensible voting method or we could just make sure that nobody else runs <laughs> and they've chosen the latter mm -hmm. uh, which is why our ballot access laws uh, are the way that they are mm -hmm. um, it. Uh, so we really got that as an issue, like the ballot access laws are, are so high that even under approval voting right now, it, it would take a concerted effort in order to get people on the ballot in some jurisdictions. Um, but that may wane a bit in terms of the that hurdle. Um, it, uh, it's likely to go down as the spoiler effect is not so much of an issue or an incentive for people who are elected to create these crazy ballot access laws. Um, but over time, it may be that there are a ton of people on the ballot, like maybe you don't want 50 people on the ballot. Maybe that's too too many. And you have to figure out what types of uh, fair barriers that allow a, a reasonable number to, to be on that ballot. Mm -hmm. But even if you have a bunch of people on the ballot, one of the nice things about approval voting, uh, really more than about any other voting method, is because the expression element is so easy in terms of picking as many candidates as you want, it really lends itself well to long ballot lists, uh, which even if you have really generous ballot access, it would work well in, in that context. And you can always narrow it down. So like you can use say an open primary um, and then uh, if you don't have to do it to a top two, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in or whatever the state laws are, you could have say a top four or a top six in the, in the general election. So you can have that crowded field in the primary and then take it down to a number that's more manageable in the general election. Um, well, we're about out of time. Do you have any closing thoughts for us? Um, thanks for offering this opportunity. Um, and I would encourage folks to go to our website at electionscience.org. We have a, a very Non pushy newsletter that we don't that we uh, uh, are mindful of our subscribers' time with, mm -hmm. and we put out lots of great stuff there. And uh, we encourage you all to provide us uh, with support by sharing it with uh, uh, your friends and family in terms of this information. This is something that most people are not aware of, and I also believe that Google has matching for yep. uh, uh, for charitable gifts. I would encourage that as well. Uh, help us keep up the good work and help uh, you to be able to see the outcomes that you want to see. Okay. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, I, I can plug the newsletter too. I, uh, I really enjoy those emails and it's always great content that's really well thought out and um, very often quantitative like this to kind of show how, how would things be with a better system. But yeah. yeah, thanks for coming to Seattle and uh, giving this talk. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Thank <laughs> you.